Hello, and welcome to In the Studio. I'm your host today, Alex Silva-Satter, and our guest is Scott Evans, who is a local author and the editor of the Blue Moon uh, Literary and Art Review. Um, hello, Scott. How are you? Doing, doing fine, Alex. How are you? Excellent. So, um, Scott uh, attended UC Davis, uh, the master's program, and, and got his English degree there. You've also um, been a teacher at the uh, University of the Pacific, and you also taught at uh, LSU, correct? And then uh, I believe I you're also teaching some classes at UC Davis still, right? I, I have taught at UC Davis. I taught ESL. Okay. At Davis, and then I also taught summer courses at the King Hall Law School Outreach Program for three years. Okay, so how about you tell us how how did you get started as a writer? Is this something that you've always wanted to do, or did you come to it by another path because you've written novels as well as being the editor of the uh, Blue Moon? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I started writing when I was uh, about 10 years old because I found a typewriter in my parents' closet and pulled it out and started uh, typing up a story about Dracula. I was a big fan of horror movies. <laughs> so, but I didn't really um, write seriously um, until probably college. And then um, I did. Uh, go to UC Davis grad school in creative writing. So I did a lot of writing then. But then um, I started teaching. And uh, my first full-time teaching job was at uh, Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And then um, my wife and I moved back to California. And I taught part-time um, at Sierra College and a couple other places before taking a full-time teaching job at the University of the Pacific. And that's where I taught for 32 years until I retired about a year and a half ago. And when and, uh, did you decide to do your first novel? Yeah, the first novel, um, Tragic Flaws, mm -hmm. um, it, I started writing this actually after my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, I had also been moonlighting at Delta College. And uh, because of budget cuts, those classes were taken away. So I found myself with a lot of free time. And um, since there was so much in my life that was outside my control, sitting down to write a novel gave me a sense of control because you can control what your characters do, you can control the plot. So it was a very therapeutic exercise. And in fact, my first book is dedicated to my wife who I'm happy to say, knock on wood, is cancer free. Um, so yeah, and I just fell in love with writing. It took me about a year to uh, write that book. And you know, mm -hmm. the, the writing the first draft is the fun part. Um, Editing and revising several times um, becomes laborious and a little tedious, but you've got to do it. And then um, I started working on my second book, um, which is titled First Folio. And mm -hmm. that took uh, about five years of research because um, it examines the question of who really wrote the works of William Shakespeare. So five years of research, lots of trips to the Shakespeare authorship, conference up in Portland, Oregon, um, a number of books investigating that. So that was a, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into when I started the research on that. <laughs> but all of my <laughs> books, my literary mystery series have a, um, some kind of a literary link. The mm -hmm. third book is mm -hmm. titled Sylvia's Secret, and it's about Sylvia Plath. And the most recent book that I've written is called The Paris Papers. And um, oh, even newer is, than the one I saw. Pardon? Even newer than the one I saw, The Caribbean Prisoner. Yeah. Um, no, The Paris Papers is um, set in Paris, obviously. And mm -hmm. um, it's about um, Hemingway's first lost book manuscript. If you read The Paris Wife about Hadley Richardson, you'll know that um, 
when uh, Hemingway was up in Switzerland, he sent a telegram to his wife to bring his book manuscript up to Switzerland from Paris uh, because he had met an editor, editor up there who was interested. And so unfortunately, mm -hmm. she put not only the whole book manuscript, but also the carbon copies of that oh. uh, manuscript oh. in a briefcase and then got on the train, but she got off the train briefly to buy some cigarettes and water. And when she came back, the, the briefcase had been stolen. And so, so uh, the premise of my book, yeah. Uh, in, in my opinion, that was the beginning of the end of Hemingway's first marriage. So, um, <laughs> so that the Paris Papers explores that. All right. So you're the editor of the uh, Blue Moon Literary and Arts Review. And uh, what was the impetus for creating this uh, publication? Um, excellent question. About, let's see, I guess 14 years ago now, um, I was teaching a creative writing class at the Davis Art Center. Um, the Davis Art Center used to be in a two-story house uh, near downtown, but then, as you probably know, um, they built a facility in um, uh, North Davis Park on the corner of Covell and, um, oh gosh, what's across the street? Anyway, and it's a beautiful facility. So I was teaching a class, um, and I believe it was in May, and after about the third um, session, it was a weekly class, I realized that there were a, a bunch of really talented writers in this class. And I decided while walking home from the class, um, I live about four blocks away, I was walking through the park, mm -hmm. I decided that I wanted to um, publish their writing because it was so good. And mm -hmm. it happened to be the night mm -hmm. of a, the second full moon in May, and that's where the title Blue Moon came from. And ah. this is a copy of the very first one, which was printed up at Kinko's, <laughs> very <laughs> amateurish, the first one. But I was able to showcase um, a number of the authors, um, some of whom went on to uh, publish quite, um, quite, uh, successfully so and I still run the writers critique group but uh, I don't make them pay for it anymore we do it out of my house we meet on Thursday nights from 6 30 to 9 30 and um, I've had um, usually you know we we shut down because of the pandemic but now that everybody in the group has been has gotten their second vaccine we're going to start up again um, in April so um, we meet for about three hours and read our work out loud and share copies and um, then go on to publish. My, uh, a lot of the writers have uh, gone on to publish. Yeah, those are covers of the Blue Moon Literary and Art Review. Mm -hmm. Including the most recent issue, which is uh, number 12, correct? Well, actually, no, the most recent issue is number 17. Oh, but wow. okay. I've had awesome. trouble with the website getting the new issues up on the website. So um, ah, I see. Okay. here's the newest issue. So unfortunately, um, I got to get my web person to um, update the website. Mm -hmm. And how how has the review evolved from when you first started it? Has it you have you found that it's changed, or I mean, you've been doing it for a while? Yeah. Um, well, for about thirteen years. Um, when we first started, it was pretty much I was just publishing uh, the writers who were taking my class, uh, my workshop. But um, as we grew and expanded and got noticed by other publications, we started getting submissions from all over the state and then from all over the country. And now we get submissions from all over the world, um, wow. especially uh -huh. because we now publish through uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, the old version of CreateSpace. Uh -huh. So uh, the magazine is available on Amazon. And so it gets uh, a lot of notice. We, in fact, we just had a submission from Hong Kong, 
we, we published writers um, from Germany and Italy, and it's, that's really fun, but, you know, they get two complimentary copies as their payment, and sometimes sending those to places like Europe can, can be very expensive. That's one of the downsides of, of being international. Well, you're doing it as a digital and a physical publication. Do you think there's a, an importance to still having physical, uh, you know, because everyone's, oh, digital, digital, but the importance of having a physical publication? I do. Um, you know, when I first got a Kindle, I started reading a lot of books on my Kindle. And I got really tired of it. And so now when I read for pleasure, I like to read um, a book that I can hold in my hand. And um, mm -hmm. so I think there are still a lot of us old dinosaurs who prefer um, physical books to digital. I still occasionally, you know, read stuff on uh, a, a electronic device. But um, mm -hmm. when I'm reading for pleasure, I want to hold a physical book. I still subscribe to magazines, I, so I like to hold magazines too. I'm the same way. I still read books all the time. <laughs> so um, I noticed that one of in the uh, one of the things that you solicit for are excerpts from novels that are in progress, and I was wondering mm -hmm. if maybe you could tell us about why you feel it's important for an author to to get that published before they finished everything. How does that help the author develop? And, you know, besides, you know, maybe developing some publicity and so forth. Right. So one of my missions, uh, you know, I've taught writing for years and years in, at the college level, but I've also been mentoring other writers for years. And I find it really, really re rewarding, um, not just because they uh, put me in their acknowledgments page, although I do appreciate that. <laughs> But it's just um, really rewarding to um, help other writers promote their work. Um, and so when a novel is, a novel excerpt is accepted by a literary review like The Blue Moon, um, it really helps boost the ego of a struggling writer. And more than once, we've published um, an excerpt from an author's very first novel. And I know from experience that something like that can can really encourage a person to uh, continue with their work. That's excellent. So as a successful novelist yourself, um, what advice would you have to young people that are young writers that are out there listening now? Are there particular things they should focus on uh, as far as skills or, uh, I mean, people can write any genre, but. Yeah. Well, I have a few pieces of advice, actually. The, the first piece of advice is don't give up. Just keep writing. Even if you feel like um, what you've written one day is just really bad, don't give up. Keep working on it. Um, my second piece of advice is to try to set a, a schedule of a time when you can write um, at least for an hour a day. And um, during that writing time, just write. Don't do anything else. Turn off your phone. Um, just write, even if what you've written uh, doesn't seem very good. But if you push yourself to write at least for an hour, sometimes you'll, you'll find a rhythm and you'll keep writing. There have been writing days when I've started at 8 o'clock in the morning and I didn't end until two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, maybe just to take a brief break for a quick bite of lunch, because I found um, the rhythm and momentum to just keep going. Other days, my writing schedule is usually to write about three hours in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, sometimes you, you do your three hours or maybe an hour, and um, that's all you can do that day. I always try to end with a sentence where I know what the next sentence is going to be so that when I come back to it, um, I can pick up where I left off. Uh, in fact, if I, if I finish a chapter, I'll often start the next chapter with just a few lines just to, you know, make sure that I can pick up the pace. The third piece of advice I would give is to find a writing group, a writer's critique group, so that you can share your work with others 
and um, get feedback. Of course, my group here in Davis, we meet on Thursday nights from 6.30 to 9.30. And if anybody's interested in joining that group, uh, as long as they've received both COVID shots, they'll be free to uh, attend in person. And they can contact me uh, if they're interested. And I think one last sort of follow up along those lines is how important is it for a, a very young writer, you know, to maintain their own voice when they're going to be getting a lot of advice from teachers and from other people critiquing them and stuff? Like, how do they decide, well, maybe I do need to change something about my technique or style versus holding on to what makes their voice unique? That's a challenging issue for any writer. Um, and I think the more experience you gain, the more you find your own voice. I know that my writing style in my first novel, Tragic Flaws, um, has, has really evolved so that my, my writing more recently has become, I think, better. So you find your voice by um, exercising your skill, your craft of writing, but also getting feedback. And um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I write my literary novels in the third person, limited omniscient third person, but I also write um, memoirs in, um, you know, coming of age stories in the first person. And it's really interesting to, to change person and, um, see how that affects your style. Okay. Um, well, I think that's uh, almost uh, it for today as far as time. Do you have anything else you'd like to share with the viewers about the Blue Moon Literary and Arts Review or Art Review? Well, just um, if you are a writer and you have some short stories or poems or artwork and you'd like to submit it, go to the website, which is listed there and feel free to submit. Okay. You can also just submit it directly to me um, at my web at my um, email address, which is evans327 at comcast.net. Okay. And uh, that's uh, all. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today and share your advice for the writers out there and tell us about the Blue Moon Literary and Art Review. That's it. Sure, for happy the to be here. Um, go ahead. Thank you.